In today's video, I'm back in Austin, Texas, spending time with renowned bespoke cowboy bootmaker Lee Miller. We have spent a total of six days filming with Lee, documenting the process of his incredible craft. During this time, Lee and I had the opportunity to delve deeper into the craftsmanship and tradition of his own bootmaking history, as well as discussing the wider history of the cowboy boot. So join me as we step inside Texas traditions for a chat with legendary bootmaker Lee Miller. One of the things I'm really struck by is how you know, the process can't be rushed. I mean, we're three days into just where we are now. You had been uh, 10 days into uh, the boots prior mm -hmm. to that. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, we still have, you know, two to three days ahead of us, and mm -hmm. we're going to come back for later. Right, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the craft, what's, I think, beautiful about the craft is that it has to be honored. And to honor the craft, you can't rush it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're obviously trying to do it in, a, in an expedient way, but at the same time, we have to do it the right way. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I've just got the process down. Yeah. The, the way that I go from st one step to the next, um, I've done it long enough to know how it all works out. But, um, you know, we can rush it if we wanted to, but I would prefer to slow it down and just do everything right. Yeah. Well, there's a difference between, you know, rushing and cutting corners. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yeah. one of the things that's abundantly clear yeah. is that, you know, there are absolutely no corners cut here in this workshop. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I truly, uh, you know, your work represents yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you do wonderful work, that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I'm trying to make sure that the customer has something that fits their feet, that's comfortable, that's going to be durable, that's made in a traditional sense, but it's going to be beautiful and artistic. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I love doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody loves something, yeah. you know, um, and, and, and this is just happens to be what I love to yeah. do. Well, certainly, I think that love shows forth in just your passion for the product, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, and that's what I love about, you know, traditional uh, artistry is that, you know, what you're doing is as much of a piece of an art as something that's hanging on a wall, but it is married to the pragmatism of the fact that it, it at the end of the day, has to be a boot that someone can wear and, and wear possibly into a field, as we were talking about earlier, to dig ditches, <laughs> Yeah. right? But yeah. it still has this incredible... Uh, uh, craft and beauty, uh, you know, the quality of the craftsmanship and tradition, I always go back to that, but I mean, it couldn't be any more clearly represented in your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's what we're trying to do, Kirby. I mean, uh, uh, working for the people that I've worked for in the past, um, I'm trying to carry on what they've taught me, but also um, bring it even further forward. Yeah. And so I'm always open to new ideas and, and experimenting and uh, meeting others and talking to them about how they do things. Um, but I, but I, I really, um, I love what I do. Um, it, it is artistic, and I always wanted to be an artist. Um, I was a lousy painter. <laughs> I was a good sculptor. Okay. And so maybe my cowboy boots, they're my sculpture. Yeah, you know? no but, question. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I love to draw. And in Charlie Dunn, I found somebody that I could respect as an artist because mm -hmm. he was an artist. So, um, so here in a cowboy in the cowboy boot, you get to marry um, the traditional craft aspect with the artistic beauty, mm -hmm. and then you also get to put in there the wonderful fit. Yeah. And so all those things together make what we do. Yeah. Well, one of the other things, though, just to add on to that again, is just the tradition, right? And one of the things I think that's very fitting for Texas traditions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, is really. Um, you know, is respecting uh, and really harking back to a lot of ways the traditional way of making a cowboy boot. And we were talking about this with that uh, thirty-pound penny nail. Oh yeah, the forty. Yeah, you know, the forty-pound yeah, penny yeah, nail. Yeah, yeah. How you know you could use a, um, a fabricated metal shank. You could use a plastic shank. You mm -hmm. could use a leather shank. You could even yeah even a even 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 a wooden, a wooden shank. shank. Yeah. Uh, but there is something romantic about the idea that you're pounding out mm -hmm. that forty-pound penny nail in right. the same way that it has been pounded out, you know, for as long as cowboy boots have been around. Absolutely, yeah. And as you said, in some ways, even harking back to the Roman days yeah. of how shoes were being made, you know, 2,000 years ago. Yeah, so if Abraham Lincoln wore boots, which he did, if you were to take them apart, what would you find? A nail. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's just, it's a historical, traditional method of making a boot. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so there's all these different aspects of making a handmade boot 
and uh, you know I like to just bring them all together um, and uh, so we make a beautiful well-fitted cowboy boot out of the best materials we can find and and just uh, hopefully that's gonna make the customer happy yeah well I know that yeah. you've got uh, plenty of happy customers and you've got several years worth <laughs> yeah. of uh, future yeah. ha happy customers yeah. waiting in the wings yeah, yeah. Uh, and that as you you said is if you do great work and if your passion kind of put your uh, yeah. put your life into it, then um, well, you know, people then the rest will, is people easy. will find you. Yeah, you know. So if you're if, if if you're all of those things, people will want what you do. Yeah, and and so inadvertently, just by being yourself, mm -hmm. that's me. Um, because I want those things, I'm busy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, but but really, I love I love the craft, and I want to continue doing this, and eventually maybe teaching it yeah um, you know I mean I've had students in here and taught them and um, and and um, it's fun to do that it's yeah. fun to, it's fun to share what mm -hmm. we do we get to share it you know through people like yourself but also on our own social media pages yeah and getting to meet the other shoemakers that I've been delighted to meet yeah and uh, and and it's just it's a lot of fun yeah but it's interesting how social media has kind of shrunk the world and yeah. so now, I mean, you speak about meeting other shoemakers. I know that on Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, Texas Traditions, um, you're, you're quite active. And I know that you interact regularly with shoemakers uh, really all over the world. Yeah, and it's, you know, I'll, I might get questions from a bootmaker or a shoemaker in Germany. And um, he'll say, well, dear colleague, how do you do this? Um, somebody in Argentina. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody in, in you know, I mean, literally, as you yeah. said, all over. All over. And and it's all this, the, you know. There's, it's wonderful to meet these people who want to do something like what you do. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not a cowboy boot, yeah. But maybe they're just interested in. Oh my goodness, how do you pattern this? Or yeah. how do you do this? Or how do you do that? Or I've watched you work, and I'd like to see. Can you please explain this? Um, so social media does that. It gives us that venue for sharing what we yeah. do so yeah. well i think in a lot of ways you know whenever i think of, uh, of john lobb uh, st james like the original john lobb um you know they've been around for a long time and in a lot of ways um have become almost the standard bearer or the torch bearer if you will for west end bespoke shoemaking mm -hmm. and you know after kind of spending a few days in your shop and seeing you know how willingly you share your knowledge with other people allowing us in here to film this you know, I, I can't help but think that in a lot of ways, you know, you are the John Lobb, but for Western cowboy boots, yeah. you know, really representing uh, that standard and holding fast to it uh, and while carrying that torch forward. Yeah, well, inadvertently, you, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't because I, I, I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. It's just that, uh, you, you know, if somebody is interested in what you do, you can't help but want to share it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, John Lobb is... Uh, a historical place, and uh, someday I hope I get a chance to yeah, visit well. Lobs. It would be amazing to see all the the the, the wonderful lasts that they've done, and uh, uh, that would be so much fun. Yeah. See if they could dig your letter out of the following <laughs> cabinet somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My rejection letter. <laughs> You know, there's been an interesting, you know, kind of evolution in, in, in Western cowboy boot making where, you know, maybe you're cutting this out by hand, mm -hmm. but that, you know, maybe other boot makers would be using pre-made welts. Right, yeah. And, and so I think probably if you go back to 1930, uh, uh, in the boot making world, people were doing it more the way that they were do they're doing it currently in, in, uh, in, in the West End. Because yeah, it hadn't been industrialized. No, yet. that's correct. And so uh, as, uh, as people, as the older boot makers died out, a lot of the younger ones had more of a, a factory background. And so they started introducing more factory methods and things subtly changed. People started buying pre-made welt. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they were using gemming on the insole, a cloth mm -hmm. rib, mm -hmm. as opposed to channeling it by hand the way yeah. that you'll see it done in Europe. And, and so what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just trying to do the absolute best I can. Yeah. And so it, it, rather than buying a pre-made welt, um, which uh, oftentimes 
is junky. Mm -hmm. The leather, you can't control the quality. So I'm buying a European bend. A full and bend. I, uh, yeah, this is correct. Correct. Cap. Yeah, and then I'm I'm stripping them out and uh, getting the getting the, the dimension that I want, the correct width, and then just using these tools to hand hand prepare the welt. And there are subtle differences between what I do and what you might see being done uh, in other places yeah. uh, in, in terms of handwork. Yeah. But the, but the fact is that the the basic premise is do the absolute best you can with the best materials that you can get and you want that's the the goal is to give the customer the best product they can get mm -hmm. and so the way that i control that is with the methods and materials that i use yeah and so it's more hand work i love i mean my goal is to just give you something that's just unbelievably beautiful yeah and and so to achieve that i don't want to use anything that i think is inferior well what's interesting about that though is that you know most of the work that you're doing will never be seen. Right? I mean, once the outsole goes on yeah. this, no yeah. one's going to know that this was completely yeah. done by hand. No one's going to know that you channeled that's, it out. That's correct. You yeah. Know, yeah. And we're going to get to the bottom making here mm -hmm. a little bit later today, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. But that's what I think is part of the magic of a bespoke pair of shoes or cowboy boots is that all of the work that goes into the integrity of the piece mm -hmm. that is never seen. Right. Right. No one knows that this was cut out by hand, but we right. do. And that is part of what makes a pair of, you know, Lee Miller boots, you know, so reliable is that that integrity that kind of permeates every single characteristic of the way the boot is constructed. Uh, that, very true. And one aspect of all of this is that the boot will feel different than some uh, another boot made a different yeah. way. So you you won't you won't be able to identify what it is. Mm -hmm. But it's all in a sense, you could wor use the word stuffing. Yeah, it's all the things that are that are under your foot mm -hmm. that contribute to the way the boot feels. Yeah, so you'll feel support like you've you won't feel in a factory boot. Yeah, and 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 there will be no plastic or no cloth or yeah. anything like that. Um, so you'll feel it, but you won't understand Stand it. it. And yeah. and that's just the, and, and also too. I mean, if I'm using better quality materials, then it's the boot will be more durable. Yeah. It's not going to fall apart. Yeah. Well, I guess in some ways it's like the, the net sum is, is greater than the sum of the parts, right? Mm -hmm. All those things really right. come together to create exactly. something that is yeah. meaningful and significantly different, yeah. but hard to peg on any one thing. And we had this conversation yesterday of how, you know, a lot of the people, a lot of your customers, whenever they put on a pair of your boots, it's really kind of transformative because they've never experienced anything like that. Yeah. You can't explain it to someone. And I've got a lot of pair, uh, many pairs of bespoke shoes. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a profound difference in how they feel and how right. comfortable they yeah. are. And you can't you, you can't, can't really it. put your finger on it as to what it is, but I think it's just the it's that human element. It's just yeah. somebody did this with great care, trying to just give you the absolute best that they could give you. Yeah. And that's what that's what I'm doing. I'm yeah. trying to do that. It's kind of uh, uh, what a pleasure it is to do this for people to to make their feet happy. You really can't do it for yourself. I can't measure my own feet. Mm -hmm. I can set up my own last and make my own boots, yeah. but I can't measure my own feet. I'm dependent on somebody else doing it. But, uh, but it is a real treat to be able to wear them because you're all of a sudden, you know, I mean, I have lots of running shoes. I have dress shoes and they kill my feet. Uh, the, the running shoes don't kill my feet. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that cowboy boots, if they're made properly, will feel like nothing else you've ever worn. Yeah. And uh, and that's that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, but it's it, I enjoy it. Yeah. And and obviously um, everyone goes everyone comes at it from from a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not trying to preserve the past. Yeah. I'm just trying to give you the customer the best that I can give you. Yeah. Um, and if I do that, then I'll have plenty of work and uh, yeah, happy that, customers. Yeah, that's that's the goal. Yeah, is to is to give somebody something of quality. Yeah, but you have done that in many ways by reaching into the past and resurrecting traditional techniques. Yeah, you have to constantly be um, looking at the past and going, uh, you know, what of this? And then, like anything, you have to test it. You have to go ahead and take that method, try it out in in real life, and see if there's anything to it. Mm -hmm. And some of these things you just throw away. You yeah. say, this is not as good as this. Yeah. And so by doing that, by reading, by looking, uh, social media is a great way to see 
uh, people doing their work. Mm -hmm. And I, I look at it all the time. I ask questions of the makers, and sometimes they're nice enough to respond. Yeah. And, and so that's the way that you learn. You, 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 you take these observations, and then you test them. And, and that, that's exactly what I do, yeah. you know, and, uh, and it little, so uh, Instagram, social media is a great venue for yeah. uh, trying to progress as a craftsman. Well, and you've had a lot of other craftspeople actually come through the workshop over the past several decades. Yeah, we've been really lucky. I mean, the guy that came here from Munich who stayed two and a half years, um, I learned from him. Uh, he came here through the German government to mm -hmm. learn how to make cowboy boots, but I also got a chance to learn how he made shoes in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very interesting. We had somebody here from Switzerland. We had somebody here from Paris for nine months who's now back in Paris making shoes. Um, I got to learn how they do, th how he was taught. He went through the actual proper training in France. Um, I can't pronounce the name of the company, mm -hmm. but it's a company in France that still exists today yeah. to preserve the old ways, mm -hmm. the old crafts. Yeah. So yes, by, by having people come here from other places, um, not only do they learn what you can show them, but you learn from working with them. Yeah. And that's been a lot, I, I really enjoy that transfer of knowledge. Yeah, but it's such an oral tradition. I mean, none of, I mean, a lot of this is recorded in books, but ultimately how it is yeah. passed along and shared has always been yes. orally through relationships. Exactly. And, and that's, you want to cultivate that. Um, um, there, there's so much to learn. You'll never live long enough to learn it all. Mm -hmm. But if the goal is just to keep moving forward, keep getting better, um, I can tell you that the things that I'm doing today, I wasn't doing them 30 years ago, yeah. but it's that continual refinement of what you know um, and always looking for, uh, you know, for a, a better way. Yeah. It's that, that's what makes you a better boot maker. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things, I mean, I've had the privilege of, of course, spending a t uh, time with a lot of absolutely master craftspeople and artisans. And one of the things that I've seen that really kind of differentiates or separates the true masters from other artisans is that they're perpetual students. Mm -hmm. They're always yeah. learning, right? They're always curious. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, they're not just set, you know, yeah. and they were taught to do something a certain way and they right. only do it like that for right. the rest of their careers or yeah. lives, but that there's a constant evolution and this perpetual right. uh, progression of the craft that, you know, today, I, you know, from what you've shared, I mean, it sounds that you certainly believe that you're making a much better boot today than you were 30 10, years 15, ago. 30 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. So there's the, all the terms of master and apprentice, journeyman, master. Um, people will call themselves masters. I don't call myself a master. Yeah. I'm, I'm a journeyman. Yeah. And the reason I call myself a journeyman is because I'm on that journey. journey yeah. I'm, 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 I'm not, uh, I've not mastered it yet. But I'm trying to. That's my goal. Yeah. Well, no one truly masters anything. Yeah, you're exactly. A true yeah. Of so, so really, if somebody was to say, "Hey, you're a master," I'd say, "Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm really a journeyman." Yeah. Um, and and that's the being on the journey, being on the path of of getting better, is really what it's all about. Yeah. You know, it's that always, as you said, always trying to get better, always trying to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had the pleasure of meeting many wonderful shoemakers um, and bootmakers and we all when we get to talk about the nuts and bolts of what we do there's always these little kernels of knowledge that are, yeah. that are transferred between everybody and it, it is an oral history yeah, yeah. it's an oral it's trade yeah an oral, oral trade, tradition yeah. you can read a book but it's not going to be anything like really doing it and doing it day after day after day after day. Or having someone show you. Exactly. Yeah. You know, here in this shop, working for Charlie Dunn, I was surrounded by amazing people from all over, uh, pr primarily Mexico, and they were showing me little things that they learned in Mexico mm -hmm. that they taught me. And when I talk to uh, shoemakers today, funny enough, they'll tell me, oh my goodness, you know, I'm doing the same thing, and I'm going, oh my... The guy in Chihuahua, Mexico, showed me that um, in 1982. Yeah, and, and then and this you're is like another now. person yeah. from Sweden or from yeah, exactly. You know, England. Exactly, yeah. And, and so it's funny how it, there's all these little connections, uh, and you don't realize it. But, um, but I was lucky to work here for Charlie and to be around the people that he had, and they helped me learn. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just kind of 
continuing that. Continuing it, yeah. yeah. yeah so. What is the relationship between kind of, um, you know, the Mexican tradition of boot making and the American tradition? Is it one of the same? Just like in Italy, they have a huge um, uh, uh, tradition of craft. Yeah. But, um, it, you know, the, a lot of the old makers are, are gone. Yeah. And so things have changed. But there were a lot, I mean, there was certainly Mexican influence in oh, Western yeah, bootmaking. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, so if you, look about, if you look at how Western bootmaking came to be, it was the European craftspeople that came here. Okay. And then it was also the Mexicans that drifted north and became the, the labor force. And so when you had those two uh, intertwined, you got the cowboy boot. The cowboy boot. And so a lot of it is, you know, the, the, some of the names of the components are in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it's, the, it's, it's, dr it's drift, it's the Mexicans drifting north, it's the Europeans coming to this country, and that's how it came to be. Yeah. And, and so the cowboy boot is a combination of those things. Really? The European influence. And the, and the Central America and Mexican influence, yeah. it all came to be here. When did the cowboy boot really kind of um, manifest itself as its own kind of genre of shoemaking, right? Because you had the European yeah. influence and then, you know, whatever the Mexicans were doing. I mean, those existed independently of one another yeah. before they ultimately yeah. kind of merged and evolved into this. Probably 1880s. Really? So the when, late 19th century? Yeah, when it all came, it all started to germinate. Okay. Um, but uh, you couldn't have had one without the other. The other, yeah. And, and so um, the 1880s, it all started. Uh, by the 19, by 1910, it was really in full bloom, and and uh, uh, you know, uh, and that's when so you had a real rich, very distinct mm -hmm. tradition of Western cowboy boot making. Absolutely, that yeah. didn't exist prior to that. That's correct. In the early days, mm -hmm. you know, when we're talking 1880s, the cowboy boot was more of a utilitarian piece of footwear. I mean, you were riding horses. Yeah, you needed something tall to protect your leg. And it might have had, a, uh, you know, they didn't have the cements, the adhesives that we have today. So you, they had a little bit of, of stitching just to hold everything hold together, together yeah. so that the tops wouldn't separate. Um, but slowly the boot became more decorative. The cowboys would ask for more, you know, could I get a, a red star put on my boot? Um, so c the boot slowly be went from just a work boot mm -hmm. or a piece of utilitarian footwear to something that was a little bit more flashy. Yeah. And it was the cowboys asking the bootmakers at the beginning of the trail, and at the end of the trail, we're talking Texas and Kansas. Mm -hmm. That's in between, that's the beginning and the end. Th it was those bootmakers that were making the boots that the cowboys were asking for. Yeah. And little by little, the cowboy boot changed. Mm -hmm. And so now today we get a tulip pattern that probably went, you know, you could, if you looked at a piece of footwear back in 1890, you would have seen maybe a slight stitching of tulips, tulips. on there. Yeah. And of course, that's a European mm -hmm. uh, uh, influence. Um, and these were immigrants, right? Yeah, so maybe were, that was a way to, yeah. you know, kind of integrate something. Yeah. Well, this is what they home. knew, yeah. you know, and, and so um, they brought it here to the New World, mm -hmm. and they were being asked to add a little decorative work, and so they said, oh, I'll put... Uh, some tulips on there. Yeah. Um, so you saw, that's how the boot came to be. Mm -hmm. And now the boot is anything that you want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, tall, short, pointy toes, low heels. It's anything that you want. Um, but it did change. Um, you, you know, you saw back in the 1960s, um, you know, the youth back then embraced cowboy boots. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it became something of the counterculture mm -hmm. where all of the you know, the Beatles were wearing cowboy boots, or the Beatles were wearing Chelsea boots, or all of that, you know, you saw it in film, on TV shows, and it, they introduced it to the youth. And that's how I started. Yeah. Because my older brothers were wearing cowboy boots, and I was in awe of them too. Yeah. And so at 14 years old, they were giving me their cowboy boots, and I was sawing the toe off and trying to change it and yeah. ruining them. But, but that's how I was introduced to it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I was just fascinated by them. Yeah. So it was the counterculture, the culture of that day, mm -hmm. that, got, that went ahead and, and uh, reintroduced it to the youth of America. Yeah. And that's how I saw it. Yeah. 
Interesting. And so that corridor between Texas and Kansas, you know, where they were doing the cattle drives, I and mean, right. that really was kind of the, the birthplace of, mm -hmm. you know, the yeah. Western mm -hmm. cowboy boot. Yeah, so Kansas fights with uh, Texas Do they? as to the actual who was the real birthplace yeah. of, uh, of cowboy boots. But mm -hmm. really, whether it was the beginning of the trail or the end of the trail, some say, well, at the end of the trail, the cowboys had money, so they could go ahead and buy boots in Kansas. Mm -hmm. Or the beginning of the trail where, oh, I'm getting ready to go on a trail ride, I need some boots. And so we don't know where it started. Yeah. and We don't know if it was started in Texas or it started in Kansas. You can fight till you. No one's ever really going to to know. Uh, There's no answer to that. But yeah. but the fact is, it, it was it was in that whole Corridor. time yeah. that it all started. Yeah, the cattle drives. I yeah, mean, exactly. Were a huge. Yeah. Uh, they had to bring meat to the northern yeah. uh, cities. And this is before how they rail. Did it. Yeah. So uh, so the cowboy boot is a product of European influence, Central America, Mexican influence that all came to be here in the southwest yeah and, um, and and you know charlie dunn was part of it you yeah know, an irish uh, family mm -hmm. that made footwear in ireland that came to the u.s and made footwear here and so that was his beginning mm -hmm. yeah well it kind of makes me think of the book you know the last shall be first mm -hmm. you know about yeah. john lobb i mean they reference that i think it was some census in the 19th century where shoemaking was the largest trade yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was an incredibly yes. uh, rich trade, and it was a common profession because mm -hmm. this was before the industrialization of shoemaking, yeah. right? So everything had to be made by hand. There everybody, was no every, Goodyear had, welting. Yeah. There was no factory to do this. And yeah. so you had a huge industry of mm -hmm. uh, cobblers and independent shoemakers. Yeah, everybody that, that everybody made had feet shoes for everyone. And everybody needed footwear. Yeah, yeah. that's very true. Uh, it was a very common trade. Maybe yeah. one of the maybe the third most common trade. Yeah. Um, and and uh, and it, you know nowadays of course um, it's everybody you know it's all factory footwear mm -hmm. and and there are some makers there's about 300 cowboy boot makers in the U S most of them are in Texas uh, but there's a lot of shoemakers um, in Europe. And there are there was only a few here that I know of. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about um, you know, Western boot making is it is a distinctly and quintessentially American mm -hmm. uh, yeah. tradition, Absolute, right? I mean, it yeah. does not exist in Europe. You've got shoemaking in Europe. You've mm -hmm. got Western, yeah. you know, boot making, riding boots mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in Europe. But the cowboy boot is uh, is is it's distinctly American. and uniquely yeah. American. It's an American craft, an American yeah. art form. It's an American tradition, and that's still going on quite strong yeah. today. I mean, yeah. three hundred boot makers is yeah. you know a small that's fraction that's of what it used to be, but yeah. still is quite a large number of yeah. uh, boot makers. You can, you know, find people doing custom boots in, you know, almost any city in Texas. Exactly. Um, but you know, the, the nice thing about it is that. Um, it, it is it is an American art form, yeah. and what we're doing here is just preserving that. Absolutely, we're just trying to continually make it better, and um, uh, you know. Uh, but honestly, when you wear a pair of handmade boots, they're completely different than a factory boot. Yeah, I can't and, wait. And the common thought <laughs> is, oh, I can't wear cowboy boots; they kill my feet. Well, the reason they kill your feet is number one, they're made terribly, yeah. and number two, the last is not doesn't it's nothing like your foot. Yeah. So well, I have the same conversation with friends about dress shoes, you know, you know, like, I don't want to wear a pair of nice dress shoes. They're so uncomfortable. Yes. They hurt my feet. Yeah. You know, all of this isn't yeah. a product of the dress shoe. It's mm -hmm. a product of how the dress shoe is made. Exactly. You know, or people yeah. that, you know, say, you know, I don't like, you know, leather sold uh, dress shoes. They wear out too quickly and mm -hmm. they're uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, I wear only rubber soles. Yeah. And the reason for that being is that, you know, most of the leather used in leather dress shoes is fast tanned, super cheap leather, mm -hmm. yeah. has no longevity to it, right. has no waterproofing properties. But you get an oak bark tanned leather outsole, like what you use, you mm -hmm. know, in the construction of your boots for the insoles and the outsoles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's of a such higher quality that it's really, at the end of the day, incomparable. The idea is really use the best things that you can use. And, and if you do that and then you use good methods, you'll get a nice outcome. Yeah. But and the that, last, you know, the, you, you mentioned the last, mm -hmm. and like you said, the last shall be first. Yeah. It's no different in a cowboy boot. Mm -hmm. The last has to be the same shape as the foot, and if it is, 
your boots won't hurt. Yeah. And that's our that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And you were talking about this earlier that you know if you don't get the last correct, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. you do all this work to make the boot. Yeah. And it doesn't fit. You've wasted mm -hmm. you know what yeah. is, you know, probably what 15 days of work. I mean, you said 10 days yeah, for the top. Yeah, 10 tops. days. Yeah, so two two days for the last uh, and then the pattern work was probably another day. So there's three, 10 days for the top. We got 13. Yeah. So maybe when it's all said and done, this three weeks. this this pair of boots will take 20 days. Yeah. You know. Um, but uh, not all of them are going to be as, as fancy as this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we make plain boots too. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, I mean, you want the last has to be right. Yeah. And if and if it is correct, then everything else that follows will be okay. Yeah, falls into place. And that's why it's best to go ahead and focus mm -hmm. on getting the last right. Yeah. And that kind of brings us to where we are right here. You know, with cutting out the welt. Again, you know, whenever we started, you were talking about how you could. You know, a lot of boot makers will do will buy pre-made welts mm -hmm. yeah um, and that you know but you're using again kind of the traditional method of cutting the welt out by hand from an entire bend of leather right and yeah so this started out as a european bend and i'm cutting the welt perpendicular to the backbone and that'll give me some flex mm -hmm. so um, through trial and error and, and 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 just educating yourself you can't you have to learn how to cut it yeah so so this is cut like the toe box or the toe puff is cut perpendicular to the backbone. The soles are cut perpendicular to the backbone, mm. and it's all because we're we're paying attention to the fibers, yeah. and how the fibers move, mm -hmm. and so we're specifically doing those things to get the end result. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so, uh, I'm not buying factory welt. I'm cutting it myself. Yeah. I'm going to be hand channeling it with these tools, and um, there's various ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. This is just the way I like to do it. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's right. Yeah. Um, some people will just eliminate these tools in, in its entirety yeah. and just use a knife. Yeah. Um, but it, it, those little details are decided by the maker. Yeah. But that's giving you maximum control and discretion over. Yeah, it. you want. You know, yeah, you because skip it, an area if you see any imperfections, mm, cut yeah, it out and skip it. Exactly. What would be the benefit of me? Um, uh, using inferior materials if in the end I regret what I've done. Mm -hmm. It's better just to use uh, the best you can and, and not use anything of poor quality. Yeah. Well, great. Well, let's let you get at it. Okay.